This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geeks, show number 354, recorded on May 3rd, 2018. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find the way. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the Average Guy TV studios here in Bellevue, Nebraska. Mike, a th- uh, a severe weather, three days in a row. I've, it's been a while since I've seen, like, severe weather threats three days in a row. Like, nope, yeah, you know, Tuesday and a little bit weather, Wednesday man. and a little bit Thursday. None of it really turned out to be severe, right? It was a little rain. Make the grass. Yeah. Keeps the but dust. Kansas, just south of us, got hammered with a bunch of severe weather. Yeah. Were the, just south of us, the you know Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas area got hammered. It had been super dusty here, so I was kind of glad that uh, we got a little rain. We've had some fires here too. To it had gotten pretty dry, so the, the rain was good. Of course, it's good if you check the show notes. You're gonna really want to check them. I say that every time, but you're gonna really want to check them this week because Dwayne wrote them. And Dwayne, they're going to be pretty good, right? I mean, they got some serious links. We're going to talk about some builds and some stuff, right? That is going to be awesome, right, Dwayne? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. By the As way, always. Dwayne, welcome back, Dwayne. Good to have you back. Yeah, uh, you, you just like having me back because I do show notes. You, you do really good. It is one of the benefits. <laughs> yes, you do. You're like, here's what I'm going to talk about. And that's always awesome. So I appreciate you doing that. Hey, we'll remind you, uh, download the Home Gadget Geeks app. If you are going to listen anywhere, any, literally anywhere, but on the road, it's the best thing. HomeGadgetGeeks.com, uh, iPhone, Android, available for you. You can download that absolutely free. We thank LastPass for their sponsorship of that app. Don't forget, you can subscribe, rate, and review if you're an Apple Podcasts. You can actually do that right from your phone, by the way. If you have an iPhone, just go in there, rate, review, subscribe. Give us five stars. Or if you're going to give us less than that, I don't know if I'm that interested. But five stars, give us a review. We'd love to have you do that. You can also subscribe on uh, YouTube as well. Notification, like if you subscribe to our live channel, like what we're doing right now, uh, you'll get notified when we go live. If you subscribe to the recorded channel, same thing. Every time I post, you get, you'll get notified. A great way to kind of keep up with us. And then don't forget, give us a follow us on Spreaker. Same kind of deal. That way you know when we are going live. Big thanks to Aaron Lawrence last week. Aaron rocked it. Mike, Woo! that girl brings, like she just brings the mojo, right? I mean... She does. Yeah. I mean, but I was, was last that two week. weeks ago or was that last week? I, mean, I was last week, but she, she just, she's so good. We thought she was two weeks in a row. I have already had one beer. <laughs> <laughs> this could get interesting. Dwayne, you're going to have to really carry us here. Well, I had in my notes, big thanks to Aaron, but Mike, uh, last week's show was awesome. Thanks. There was so much. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't compare to her, right. but it was a fun catching up with you and talking to news. Well, no, but she does a great job. And, of course, I'm just reading my notes. We will uh, remind you. Uh, actually, we're going to hold Dwayne over for some crypto conversation at the end. We probably won't do much of a post show because we're going to talk a bunch of crypto with, uh, with Dwayne at the end. So stay around. Stay till the end. If you want to just skip to the end, if you want crypto, you could do that as well. But there'll be a lot of great stuff in here. So you want to hang out and get it done. Dwayne Robinson is with us again. Dwayne, uh, we already welcomed you, but welcome back. What what the what are you wearing, dude? Seriously, what is Come that? Come on, go Preds. I, I don't know why I'm on this and not watching that oh, game. There we go. Yeah, so it's how much I love you. It's NHL <laughs> season. You got a no-fly zone. What does that mean? Yes, why why yes. a no-fly zone? I don't know. It's the Winnipeg Jets, no fly zone. Oh, I this gotcha. is my shirt from when we won uh one in Nashville the other night. And don't worry, we even have catfish to throw on the ice. Boom. So it, it's on. You've got it all. You're a you're a diehard fan. You're not just a little bit fan. You're a big fan. Dwayne doesn't do anything halfway. That's that's, that's what I've learned about Dwayne. There's nothing he does halfway. You're in or you're out. Lightning hot, lightning hot, ice cold, one of the two. He's just all in. Dwayne, when you went, because you went to a couple of the playoff games, right, with yep. the NHL. Is how's the tech at those things? Because it oh, seems it's, like, I mean, you can get like there's things, there's apps, and it'll tell you how far the beer is away, right? I mean, is is it that sophisticated? Yeah, it's it's pretty cool now. And what's funny is that Nashville uh, has been known to be the number one uh, professional franchise, sports franchise Ooh. for the Predators, and it has a lot to do with what they do. So, an example is the last game I went to, Carrie Underwood sung the uh, national anthem followed by Chris Isaacs for the first period concert, followed by the second period concert, which was Phil Vassar, 
Jody Messina did the one in the middle, um, did both of the of them in the game in the first round, and Brad Paisley sang the national anthem for us. So because of where we are, and then what happens um, when they do a playoff game, normal games, they don't do this. But during the playoffs, they have now made it where they lower a 360 degree screen that goes all the way around that see through. And they do live like this video that rotates and this pre-show thing that's crazy. Wow. And I don't even know how they do a projection like that, but they do it. And it's the size of the entire rink from top and from the top of the ceiling all the way down. And it's just crazy. And, and I can tell you, I know Winnipeg is really loud, but I have to tell you, Nashville is insanely loud whenever you go into the stadium. It's it's crazy. But but like I said, I got to see the double overtime win in the fifth period the other night, and uh, I was down. There is a there is a trick here. I'm going to give away a, a little NHL uh, tip of the day for you. If you ever want to go to an NHL game, or especially a game that is like a um, a playoff game, you can actually subscribe now in Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster will it, at least they will do this verified fan and they reserve tickets for the fans day of. They will text you. You can buy the cheapest tickets that they offer and some of them are $15. Oh, wow. So they only do 100 tickets a day for that, but you can also buy any of the tickets at face value so you don't have to deal with that resell, upsell mm -hmm. crap. And then if you get the NHL app on your phone, pick the team that's your favorite team, and you scroll all the way to the bottom, there's a thing called same day upgrades. And same day upgrades allow you to be able to upgrade your tickets in real time, 30 minutes before the game, all the way down into the lower bowl or whatever. So you buy the cheapest tickets at the very top. I was in the very last row for the last game. And, when in, and as soon as it hit 30 minutes in, I went ahead and jumped on it, got all the way down to the lower bowl and I was in like section 117 with both my kids and I paid less than half for the tickets mm -hmm. compared to everyone around me. So That's a I, really good tip actually. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. Like, you know, they want to get the fans closer, right? They want to move them down. So there's an advantage to them to do that at a cheaper price. That's money. They wouldn't have never made ever. Anyways, those tickets are, are, are I am assuming those are tickets that fans have given up officially on or how does that how does it, that work so what happens is they they keep a set of tickets uh handy just in case oh, gotcha. yeah. and different levels and yeah. so you can choose in and like in nashville we can you can choose to upgrade to the club level upgrade to the lower bowl or upgrade to the all-inclusive lower bowl which is including all the food and it's uh i think 79 dollars a seat to upgrade to club 109 to the lower bowl and then 129 to get into all inclusive. And if you know much about playoff tickets, playoff tickets in the lower bowl are probably five to six hundred dollars mm -hmm. a seat. And you can pick a if you are able to get one of those fifteen dollar tickets or the set of those fifteen dollar tickets and then upgrade it for a hundred and nine bucks, you're sitting right up on the ice. It's insane. Yeah. So the craziest deal you can get. So that's mm -hmm. why and, and by the way, that's how I've done both. Both of my playoff games, I've done that. And both times I've sit, sat right down in the lower bowl. So it's so, a $15 ticket thing. Is that a drawing they're doing? So you're texting in, you're kind of, and then you get selected. So what happens is you register as a verified fan and they verify your address that you're in that market. And then once they do that verification process, you get a, you register and say, what tickets am I interested in? Am I interested in only one game or all games? And they text you the day of the game saying, you've been selected to be able to potentially get them first people to get the hundred tickets gets them gotcha. right and i did it within three minutes and didn't get them <laughs> so oh, wow. so there there's a lot of competition in that but the thing is is if you sign up for that you can also get access to the tickets that they release at face value um and then whatever doesn't sell is where they offer the same day upgrades so it's mm -hmm. just that surplus that they keep just in case they need stuff um and so you end up with some really good things. So it's, it's kind of an NHL tip. No, yeah, no, it's cool. They've learned. I think the NHL's learned a lot from the NFL because the NFL has been really good at tickets for the last decade. I mean, they've yep. the NFL has figured out uh, really the way to maximize their ticket 
you know, uh, the tickets into the stadium. They do a lot of things to get those stadium full or full, even when the teams are bad. Yeah. They do a lot of things to get a lot of fans in there. So they've really figured that out. Yeah. Nashville has, it's, I think it's over 130 straight sellouts of wow. the, of the stadium. And there is, you have to pay to get on a waiting list to get season tickets now. And I, they will I only would, let full seasons. I would not have picked Nashville as a hockey team. I would <laughs> or a hockey city. I would not have picked San Jose as a hockey city. Right. You know, yeah. we've had the Sharks there for a long time. And um, yeah. and so it's just, it's interesting. Mike, I, I found out you're an NHL fan. I had no idea. We've been hanging out for a couple of years now. Um, you got a, got you got hooked through uh, college hockey? Yeah, I got, yeah. We, so we have a college hockey team. It's actually really good in here. D1, and we've uh, been to the Frozen Four a few times in, in UNO. And so I got really hooked as a kid going to those. And so naturally... Uh, we don't have an NHL team that's close. Besides, we have like Minneapolis, Chicago, um, Nashville, I guess, is relatively close. St. Louis, some of those. But um, so I became a fan of kind of Minnesota, Chicago, and Nashville. Those are kind of the three teams I follow. And uh, But I love the Predators. So it's a lot of fun. Okay. Well, I – um yeah, what are you showing there, Dwayne? Oh, it's just oh, a catfish just, swimming by. So, so the <laughs> I, um, talking, there's a, there's a... I've become a huge fan of Olympic hockey and the rink's a little bit bigger and the plays are a little bit better and it's not quite so brutal. Although the NHL, I think, has settled down a little bit. Did you just uh, say that it's not so brutal? Yes, I did say it's not so brutal. That's what's great about hockey. Oh, <laughs> no, that's <laughs> the, well, <laughs> if you're going to a fight and a hockey game breaks out, you know, that then, you, you, know, you know, it's just um, Olympic. I don't know. Olympic hockey has been great. So whenever it's on, I really enjoy uh, watching that. The rinks are just a little bit bigger and, uh, and you just get a little more, you get a little more uh, stick play than you do in the NHL. It's just so fast. The you know what, you know, what's funny. I, uh, the commercials and stuff that's happened and the impact of them into the world, it's just hilarious. So now whenever the first person gets sent to a penalty in the penalty box in Nashville, they do this whole thing where they go, uh, they play that clip where the guy goes, welcome to, we're going to send you to the pit of misery. And the entire stadium goes, dilly, dilly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter, that's all she wanted to do. That's that's um, all she wanted to go to the game excited for, for that Just part. so she could say dilly, dilly. Get yeah. somebody a penalty. Well, I know stadiums are getting more and more tech driven, especially, you know, around the Super Bowl and some of those playoff events where there's a lot of things going on to interact with on your phone. Uh, while oh, yeah. you're sitting there, so baseball would be a great, um, a great thing for that because it's just boring. <laughs> no matter how you slice it, I mean, it's just sitting there. It's good beer and hot dogs and and peanuts and stuff like I'm that. I'm gonna have to try to go to the all inclusive section at some point and see oh, if yeah. I can on my phone order food. T- totally, that yeah, would be I'm awesome. Sure sure I just do. don't want to have to get up. C- can I order like one of those uh, urinal things that? as well so i don't have to leave porta potty hey bring that porta potty to leave <laughs> well i never thought i'd hear an all inclusive at a hockey game like that's a that's a you know a vacation in mexico <laughs> yeah. not, not well, i think there's a, i think there's like a section up at the top that you can get into which includes uh unlimited beer oh which, the all inclusive doesn't include beer no in the all inclusive in the bottom it's food and beer but i think there's oh, okay. a spot in the like in the third section at the top of the stadium that if you're in that i think they call it like the bud light zone and you get unlimited unlimited beer i think they should make the entire that first row that sits on the glass that entire row around the entire ring should be unlimited beer just because you want those guys to be rowdy on the cameras it's a lot better if those guys are (laughs) good liquored up and it's kind of funny to watch them at least you know on the other side of the glass and they can distract the players i think it'd be pretty entertaining if that if if you're sitting right on the glass all the way around you can afford unlimited beer. That's, that's a, good, <laughs> a good point, especially during playoff time. Those seats are not cheap. Oh, oh my, my gosh. Well, that, right. no, no tech in there, but fun no. to uh, <laughs> have some hockey conversation. I know with the playoffs going on right now, it's a big deal. And, uh, of course, we don't have a team here, so Omaha doesn't follow hockey as much. But um, I, I know in some places where it's going on, and I know some other podcasters that I listen to are very much into the hockey season. So whether you watch hockey or basketball, uh, good luck to the team that uh, that you follow. Speaking of teams that you follow, we are going to talk about some gaming. Dwayne, you contacted me a while back and said, dude, I got this gaming system running on a Raspberry Pi. So I want you to break that down. Tell me what you did first. Why'd you do it? Was it just a challenge? And then 
uh, tell me what, how, how you put this thing together. Um, yeah, so, so let's see, why did I do it? Uh, there's a couple of reasons I ended up doing this. So one is, did, do you remember Nintendo released this, like, it was like a retro NES that was really small and everybody started hacking them and it was impossible to find one. Yeah. Do you remember that? So yeah. I wanted to do that and I wanted to get one and I could never get one and I wasn't going to pay four times the cost of one to get one because I was like, that's just stupid that people, I, I'm sorry, if you spent that much money on one, you're a brilliant person, but not really. Uh, anyway, so um, especially after you see what I'm about to show you, you're going to be like, how, how much were they retail? Uh, they were only supposed to be like 40 or 50 bucks and people were selling them for like 200, 150, yeah, 200 really? bucks. Yeah, you couldn't find them. And then what Nintendo did, I mean, they sold like crazy and Nintendo discontinued it. And they said they didn't intend to they got a hit on their hands. They didn't really mean for it to be a hit. They just were doing it to like celebrate like a anniversary or something. And then what they then did is make another version, which was a super NES that was like this. And it looked like a mini version of, of the NES. And so, or the super NES. And the other one looked like a small version of the NES. And you got the real controllers and people even went as far as um, you could go online and get the controllers with a wireless controller for an NES. And it was the real, like, look like the real old NES controller. And and so that's pretty, that's pretty neat. And I love it. I think it was, it was kind of a cool thing. So I, that's kind of started me on this whole, man, I really want to be able to play Super Mario, Mike Tyson's punch out and tech mobile and all that stuff. Um, so that whole retro gaming thing started kicking in and I was thinking, oh man, remember all those games when I was a kid? So, so I was like, okay, I'm, I'll kind of listen in. And then I was listening to, uh, what the tech and, you know, they do a post show on that, on that with Paul Therott and Andrew Zarian. And I was like, they kept talking about it. And I, and I was, and you guys know, I've been flying back and forth internationally for like, three months and so i'm listening to podcast on, on it on the flight and they keep talking about how they're going to talk about it in the post show and i was like and i'm like whatever so i realized that you could do this from there and i was like okay i'm gonna go see what does it take right because they they went on this for like four or five episodes where they would talk about oh and in the post show we're going to talk about this and i'm like okay well you know if i'm on a patreon i'm on a patreon a good show like this one nice. and uh <laughs> thank you very much appreciate that so so what what we ran into on that one is i just said okay i'm gonna try to figure this out i don't really need to listen to a, a podcast to figure it out so it was like how hard could it be and jim do you remember back how many it was like maybe two of the meetups ago when I showed up and I had raspberry pies and I did a pie bar. Yeah. And I did like a NAS, a media center and all that stuff with a raspberry pie. And so I had like three pies just sitting in my drawer and I was like, okay, they kept talking about doing it with a raspberry pie. Let's see if you could actually do it. So I started doing some research um, and I think we start in the hardware, right? Cause everybody's probably gonna ask about that. like. Uh, I, I started with this Raspberry Pi 3 starter kit. And in my show notes, I've got links to this stuff. Um, too. And so that is kind of a thing that uh, here I can, I wonder if I can copy. Can you maybe copy and paste it into the, the chat window? I just so did. People can say, oh, okay. Awesome. Yep. yep. So if... So the thing is, is that what I did is I, I went and found, uh, that's what I originally bought. Now, and keep in mind, I've had these things for what, almost two years uh, sitting aside. Now, as far as uh, some people will ask me, how big is the micro SD card that I put in it? And, you know, I don't actually remember. I think it's a 64. If I, if I had to recall, I had a bunch of 64s laying around. You don't need 64 uh, unless you're going to load it down with some ROMs. And it really doesn't start 
eaten space until you start getting into things that are like PlayStation um, type of games. Um, so, so anyway, so I went ahead and I got the the Pi and I got a 64 gig micro SD card. Um, then there, I haven't moved it into this case yet, but mainly because I wanted to show this case to you guys. And if I put it in this case, I could oh, show it to you. Okay, that's pretty cool. <laughs> And so this thing is a little um, NES uh, thing. And if I had to tell you that I would do it over again, I wouldn't get this one. Um, I give, gave you the link to the one that I have. And, and what it is, is it's a basic case. And so if you want a basic case, you can get this. This is cheaper than what I would probably recommend. Um, and the reason is they do have ones where the actual power button and reset button work. So mine, if you know anything about Raspberry Pi, is you got to put the power in it, and there's no on off. Right. It's just pull the plug, right? And so there, you might want to think about the power adapter if you go with this case. And uh, they have ones that even have a remote control that will turn it on and off. And so, and they also have some that have fans in them and stuff like that. So, uh, so what happens is this: when you open the little tray. This is where you would plug in the USBs and the network adapter. Um, so just keep in mind that you know you're probably going to have it open like this all the time uh, when you're doing it. Uh, I am using a Cat5 connection on mine, but you don't have to. Um, and then what I also have is I, and this is the thing that was funny. I was like, oh, I need a controller, <laughs> and so I was like, huh. I'm just going to try an Xbox controller to see if it'll work. And sure as the world, if you have an Xbox One controller, and I think a regular Xbox controller that has the the USB power cord, you can plug an Xbox One controller with a USB power cord into, into it, and it works just fine. The only thing that I am running into is that... Um, there are these arcade type games that you will remember. Like when you think of Pac-Man at the arcade, um, those don't work with a controller. You need like a different type of joystick. Like you would, it's it's really made to work with a like a keyboard and a map to physical buttons. And so it, it's not like an NES where you can map those directly to a controller. So I would just warn you that if you're wanting to do arcade, I've, I've got, a different thing that I'll talk about in a bit that might help you build a real arcade machine. Um, so if you haven't figured out, the, the whole thing here was I wanted to make a Nintendo Entertainment System. I wanted to play Mario. I wanted to play Mike Tyson's Punch-Out and all that. So I had no intention of doing anything except making an NES when I started this thing. Um, what I ended up doing is I had to go find the software that would let me do it. And the software that I'm using is something called RetroPie. And I don't know if you could see the screen over my shoulder here, but RetroPie is basically this operating system for a Pi that lets you put in all these different things. And one of them is a Nintendo, I've got PlayStation, I got uh, Sega 32X, Super Nintendo, I've got arcade games, Atari 2600, Sega Master System, uh, the Sega Genesis, which they call Mega Drive, Neo Geo, Nintendo again. And so all, all of these are showing up based upon the ROMs that I've loaded. So RetroPie will give you emulators for a ton of different things. Like I, I just haven't, I got tired of downloading ROMs. So I just kind of quit one day because I got so many of them going that I don't know what to do. Um, yeah, so someone said that it, the Genesis was called Mega Drive in the UK. It doesn't surprise me that this is the logo. And I think you can actually change these logos and things in it. I haven't really played around with the, like, customizing it to my own look and feel. But there are a lot of people that do uh, do that. And if you saw, I actually had, um, a minute ago, I had the, uh, what do you call it, the Mario Brothers on, but just to give me, a, a, you know what, you guys, just to show like that Sega is working on it as well, I can fire up the old Sega and, and you'll watch behind me and you'll actually see it load up the emulator and you'll see the uh, Sonic the Hedgehog come up so that you can see that it actually runs 
all the different games that you might want. And if we really think about it, you're not really spending a lot of money. Um, I see here that RetroPie come with a ZX81 emulator. I don't know what that is, so I can't answer the question. However, it, Jim posted up a link right above that for, for you to see like the first installation, but it's also got the download and it'll give you all of the different, um, the different things that it can do. Um, yeah, the, the TX or the, the, the ZX81 was the old Timex Sinclair 1000. That was the old, uh, the old basic that you could membrane keyboard and you, oh. could put, you could just do basic on it, which was the old basic. Yikes. It would not surprise me, and if it doesn't do it, it seems like it's extensible so that you can add additional emulators. So if you really want to get into it, you can go and make it emulate all kinds of stuff. And and, and what's funny about it is, let's just kind of think about this. Uh, Jim, how much is that pie that I sent you? Um, what, about 50. 50 bucks. 50. 50. And, and truthfully, you could just get the pie and not get the whole kit because if you're going to put it in the case that yeah. I have um, a power connection, if you've got a micro USB power adapter sitting around, then you know you're talking what is a Pi three is probably what thirty five bucks, forty maybe thirty five forty, yeah, yeah, yep. And so you're talking, you've got that, and then you end up with yourself a Sega Genesis, a Sega Master System, uh, you know, all of these different games. Uh, systems and everything and and you know as far and the roms are completely legal the ones i got right uh, I'm just, i i don't know honestly the website so i i went and there's a i put a little link in here as well that gives you like install instructions where to download it um it also gave you like where lifehacker for example wrote this whole thing about how you can build this um and as far as so one of the person people in that chat room is asking so a two year old Pi which which version uh, runs okay so I would recommend that you get a Pi two or a Pi three um, but it will work for either um, when you download it you download one of the two what I would tell you is you I don't know if a original Pi will give you any trouble um, as far as running like PlayStation games. So, um, and I actually gave you a link to the, to the Pi that I'm using. So um, it's a, let's see, I think yeah, mine I was just a I Pi 3. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, just a three. so, yeah, and I don't think it really matters. It, it comes down to, does it have the ports you want? Does it have uh, like Wi-Fi if you want it and stuff like that? Because the processing power, what shocked me, is and Jim and I were having this conversation because I, I was playing Sonic and I was like, Jim, do you remember when Sonic the Hedgehog and it was like flying around the screen and we we thought that was the coolest thing because how in the world could the graphics keep up with this? And this thing runs that thing without a single issue, including like PlayStation games. It'll run PlayStation games just as good. Um, so I would tell you, it's amazing to me that it almost two year old Pi can run that much um, and, and do such a good job at it. And again, I gave you where I downloaded the ROMs that I, that I where I got some ROMs. Um, I would tell you, you know, download your ROMs at your own, uh, <laughs> however you want to do them. Just, you know, be aware. I don't know what the details are on a lot of these things, but- Don't worry, we don't uh, have a lawyer on the show, so we're fine. <laughs> so, so yeah, so just know, Download at your own risk, boys and girls. Now, I will tell you, uh, it's like one of those typical download sites where you need to make sure that you pay attention, that you don't click on trying to install something. Um, but it, it, you're not going to, you don't end up with like viruses and stuff like that or anything. It's more them trying to get you to install software. So if you aren't a smart downloader person, um, you might want to get some help on the ROM download, but it's just one of those mirror download sites that makes you redirect. Um, so just pay attention to what you're clicking on. So so that's pretty much how I, I built this thing. Um, and I will tell you the fun, uh, the most fun I've had in a long time is watching my 
little girl playing like Mario World and getting and or even better yet like Mario Brothers <laughs> and her getting upset that you run out of lives without continues. And I'm like, see, the struggle was real. <laughs> For 99 more cents, I can just keep continuing, right? Like, where's the where's the dollar keep going option? Well, like normal, you know, new game systems, all the games are like, oh, well, I can go back to my save spot, right? Where, like, and, and I, I told her, I was like, no, you've got to find the Easter eggs in it where you can get 99 lives and have to perfect the action of jumping on that turtle just right where he just sits and bounces and you have to walk away for a bit because it's going to take a while while he bounces up and down the turtle. Um, oh yes. So up, down, uh, AB, AB, select and start. Contra is on this thing and that works. <laughs> so I love that you guys have that memorized. Yeah. No, I tell you what, that was, it, it, well, you know what it used to be, if you think about it and Jim, you remember this, there used to be magazines and you would go get the magazine and the magazine would tell you all the tricks and all the cheat codes and everything. And like, I was playing Mike Tyson's punch out on it and I go through and I beat two guys and I forgot, you remember the spot where he starts running behind the bike like the fat guy's like on the bike and you're running behind him no, and it never, gives you yeah. a code. It gives you a code and that's the continue code. So if you can get to that level and get that code. And so it used to be, think about it. We didn't have camera phones, right? You used to have to run and go find like a notepad and write that thing down so that you wouldn't lose it. And then, you know, and people were like, I'll sell you how to get the Mike Tyson code, <laughs> you know? So it was, it was like, the funnest thing, I mean, it, it goes back, it brought back a lot of memories. Yeah. Uh, when you're, when I was a kid, there uh, might be people who don't have gray hair. No, I, actually, most of the listeners probably uh, that listen to this show remember those days. That was a big, that was a big deal. I, you know, I left the United States in 86 and I grew up around, so, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area in the Silicon Valley and we played a lot of arcade. Um, I had a Timex Sinclair 1000. It was still a little early, 84, 85. Uh, there were some gaming systems, but they were pretty expensive. And uh, my my parents just weren't buying that. So we would go down to uh, 7-Eleven, throw quarters, you know, play Space Invaders or play, you know, Asteroids, Pac-Man, some of those, right? Some of those early ones. And then I left the country for three years. I was in the military. A lot of things changed between 86 and 89. I got married in 89. I came back. A lot of things change when you're married and you have kids right off the bat and you don't have a lot of money. Yep. So I missed 86 to 94, probably in the gaming world. I just didn't. I was busy doing other things. And uh, actually, I missed a lot of those days. Yeah. Well, you missed out on a lot. I know. It was I know. awesome. I know. So. So let me give you a little trick here um, when you get this thing going, because every it took me a little while to figure this out. And Jim, I'm going to try something that we've never done here before. Uh, there you go. Let's see if I can do this. You tell me if this works. Uh, let's see. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we see uh, your file folders. Okay, so... What happens if you want to get to the pie? Once you get the pie installed, the thing that most people are going to try to figure out is how to get the ROMs on it. And what I will tell you is you could put the ROMs on it by doing it over like a file trans, like putting it on the actual micro SD. This is not the way you want to do it. What you want to do is put it on the network. It will register itself as RetroPie. So you just do a whack whack. If you don't know what that is, it's that. Um, a, I, I don't know how to zoom, but uh, it's basically, it's, you know, backslash, backslash, retro pie. And once you do that, you'll see these file shares. And I'm pretty sure that this is the splash screens that you can replace or modify then, but you go into ROMs and then you'll see in here a folder for all the different things that it can do by default, right? You can add other emulators like an Atari 7800. I, I never even knew that they made a 7800 i think it was the death version of the atari um so but you can come in and you can see all these different things that you can add sg1000 didn't somebody ask about that 
Uh, no, that was a Timex Sinclair 1000. Okay, sorry. Um, so, but anyway, so you can, what you do is if you have like an NES, which I'll, I'll double click on this just so you can see, and you can see here where you just drop the zip file that they give you directly in there. And that's all you do. That's how you get a game on it. And as soon as you drop something in and it recognizes that that game is in that folder and that folder is understood, it pops up in the UI so that it shows up in your menu as a selectable item. So until you put something in the NES folder that is recognized, you won't have anything there. Um, so, and then what you'll find though, is some of them, like if you start going into the PlayStation, for example, PlayStation will actually make, give you like an SRM or like a bin file sometimes, a Q and, and, and the SRM. And basically, do you remember how you had a memory card in a, on a PlayStation? Because yeah. the PlayStation was a disc, right? So you couldn't save the file on the disc. So you had to have a memory card. So it actually emulates the memory card. But it's funny because in the UI of the system, it looks like a memory card. So even in the emulator, it emulates the, the memory yeah. card. That so so that's it's it's kind of cool. But that was something it took me a little while to figure out what's the easiest way to put the ROMs on it. So what I do is I back up the ROMs to a computer, drag and drop them over. So I always download them to a single place. And then, of course, I put it in my Synology NAS as a backup, um, which is then backed up to numerous cloud services. Back up your crap. And so um, the other thing is if you, the life hacker article looks something like this so if you want to see uh the retro pie stuff and it'll tell you all about it as well as the downloading um place you can come here and again you can see that there is a different image for the raspberry pi uh zero and one two and three make sure you get the right one and then as far as retro pie will give you this whole information about how to do things and if you want like advanced configurations and you want to add different emulations emulators and things like that it'll give you all the information on how to do it so if you want to super geek out you can super geek out uh, you can become gem and then that complete rom place basically you come in here and you just say if you want like a nintendo game uh you click on it and then it what it will do is it will give you the information on all the different Nintendo games, just ignore. And basically you can come in here and find the Nintendo game that you want. So again, not not the hardest thing in the world to do, but it is something that you can do. And if you're on the audio, just know the show notes will have that and you can also download the video later to take a look at those. I just wanted to show you where these things are because of the fact that if you're looking for it, it can be a little cumbersome. But let's say, Jim, I'm the guy who just thinks it's cool. I want a retro gaming experience, but I, and maybe I even want to have my own little mini arcade. And I either w want, let's say that you have a pie and you wanted to build an arcade out of it, right? The company that I put a link here, that is that Game Room Solutions company, um, which is GRS. Because I started playing with this, I was like, oh, it's cool that I can put it in a little NES thing, but why can't I make it my own arcade? These people will actually sell you a plug and play system completely built, or you can supply your own Pi and they'll supply you the cabinet and you can get your, they'll sell you the controllers and, and all of this stuff. So if you want to go full bore um, on this thing, uh, then you can absolutely do it. And, and they're, absolutely a really good company to to deal with from what i can tell i've 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 seen a lot of good reviews on them and if you decide like oh well, all i want i want the actual like controller like i want a controller that's like the old arcade controller they have a thing where you can get the controller and it, you just plug it into the tv and it becomes a pie and it has the pie inside of it so they've got some really cool stuff like uh like jim if you go to the main screen on it to, to their main page, you can you can scroll down to the bottom to like featured products. And just to give you an idea, you can see they've got that thing in the middle that's an actual like just keyboard thing. Now the one to the right. 
the arcade control panel kit. And so you don't have to build the whole thing. You can just get this and the pies inside of it and that hooks to the TV or you can hang a TV on the wall. And so for 109 bucks, you've got this whole thing. You mount the TV to the wall and you just put this thing on a stand in front of the TV and you've got like a huge arcade game. So all of this stuff is really kind of cool. Um, and you can choose like different layouts. You can choose if you want a roller ball so that you can play all these different games. But um, it's another thing that you can do if you're if you really want to start getting into it. And and apparently this is a big deal. Like people are really getting into this stuff um, quite a bit. So I figured when I got it working, I ping Jim and I was like. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's super cool. I I kind of like the gear here, you know, we're sh we're showing on the page where you can kind of custom build your own, you know, or um, you know, you can buy them pre-made. Uyghur, have you ever done, played an arcade game? I mean, seriously. Oh, yeah. have, you, have you put a quarter in an arcade game and played it? Yes. Oh, definitely. We used to go to Nicola Play. Um, they had one in Omaha if you went there and it was it was probably more geared towards actually my generation when when I was like 5 or 7, but it was all those games and they're actually just a nickel. So you go there and play for a nickel. And I love those. Love those. And yeah. I played pinball. Uh, my dad and I still enjoy playing pinball. Hard to find a pinball machine around anymore. It's but making them we come back. They, they kind of come and go, you know. They get real popular, and then they'll fall out, and they'll get popular and fall out. Right? So, Jim, but, did you uh, say that, that there time, was a I just pinball? my SD card. So I've got it all ready. I actually put it in the pie. So if you guys could stop yapping and I get off the podcast, I'm going to go make a, a game <laughs> system now. That would be great. Well, I, it, it, the funny thing is, is it's just too easy, right? That's it the was, point. yeah. I mean, that was while we were talking, just put it on there, and even even on a Mac, you can use a little Apple Pie Baker as the utility to flash that image onto the SD card. Look at that! Even a Mac can do it. So even we know a it, Mac can do it. Even a fake <laughs> computer can do it, Jim. So did you notice that there is an actual virtual pinball cabinet that they have as well? So they sell like kits for you to be able to build a a virtual pinball and from what i understand they even have the sensors in them so you can bump them and 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 all so that's uh, things like that are really cool I, and again you know it depends on how far you want to get into it if you just want to get like you have an old pie laying around throw it in there and have fun um oh look somebody missed the pc mac banter well i brought it back because i'm old school I'm that's true we haven't had it because i came so far on the window I side know. i know <laughs> I, I'm I, I was a bad influence on that you. used to be our go-to uh thing to talk about i know that's kind of whole the whole reason i brought you on I was know. To, diversity you know to, so we could have that pc uh you know that pc mac battle and then you're like hey i like windows what? No, that's no, fun. <laughs> no, that is fun, Jim. Uh, I know. I, <laughs> In case I know. people don't know, I do work for Microsoft. Yeah, I, as a disclaimer. I think I think most people know that who who yeah. who listen now. But no, that's pretty cool. I um, I, you know, again, I think that popularity comes and goes. And um, I, I got a buddy who's built out a couple of these arcade games, and he's got them in the basement and. Just go down there and they got it rigged. You know, you don't you don't put the quarters in. You can just you know turn it on and do some things and stack up the credits and then just start playing it. And man, it had been a long time since I played um, asteroids and I was just playing for like an hour and I forgot how much that makes your thumb hurt. Cause you're like, Oh yeah. 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 Oh, do you remember? So, okay. It, well, I don't know. Cause both of you, you were out of the world, but, uh, and, you were the other one wasn't even in the world here so <laughs> but you you're overseas and and he's not even born <laughs> so it's all true it's so all true. but you, you used to have this thing that i ran into because when you use the xbox controller know that you're using that that controller component not the joystick part at the top that you normally use to move around you're using the the up down and left and right at the bottom of it you know what I'm talking about? Like the D-pad, I think yeah, is what we call it. Yep. And if you haven't played Mario Brothers or like the like Mike Tyson's Punch Out, you forget the burn on your finger that you get from using a D-pad because you don't compare it to a joystick. Yeah, and so because you've been pushing this button and it's like you know, compresses to a point where it hurts your finger, <laughs> and I for like three days I walked around the house because I kept playing this stupid thing. And my fingers just burning. It was so funny, uh, but it was awesome. Watching uh, back in the good old days, right? Yeah, that thumb burn, or the or a thumb cramp. 
you know, I remember rolling my hand over to those, you know, those rollers. Oh, yeah. And you do that enough, and all of a sudden, your hand will just kind of cramp up into the claw. Yeah, it's like, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. And then you can like, stab at your buddy's heart. and just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, it does have Mortal Kombat on it. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. No, right on. Yeah. No, many, uh, many an afternoon spent at 7-Eleven on that roller. <laughs> my friends are always so much better better at but, than me but think about it jim you could take a pie get one of those things and you can order one that has the roller ball and play oh, and right play, on and yeah. play that kind of game and it's like so cool but uh, but again you know that uh, this is my whole retro pie thing so you guys yeah, now got I to like see it. this i like I, it i think the coolest part though is the fact that it just doesn't cost that much money i mean you can have so much fun with that and even if it's just like, okay, I'm going to use it for like a week or two. And then you're like, okay, whatever. Um, I think it's worth it. I mean, I got so much enjoyment out of just watching my kids get to play the games I played when I was a kid. Uh, and the fact that they just, you see them like go, this is hard. And you're like, yes, it is hard. And, <laughs> and and they're like, and and it didn't matter. I think it goes back to you know you you realize that the graphics and everything that's so realistic is all cool and all, and that's a different type of cool. But you almost wonder where are the platformers of the old days? Like where are those type of games? And I think there was what was that game that came out, Cuphead, that everybody started playing. And then I even remember listening to like a bunch of podcast. I think one of the Twit podcast uh leo was talking about how hard it was he forgot how hard a platform game was um and i and i i kind of miss that because you don't you don't see that anymore it's all first person shooters right. and so i really miss the platformer so i think that's maybe who knows maybe somebody will pick up on bringing a platformer back you know because i think the cuphead thing sold like crazy so maybe we'll see more people bring stuff like that because I think retro gaming is maybe a little cooler than people thought. Even with Nintendo out, you know, selling the crap out of those things, they just said they couldn't keep up with the demand. Yeah. So they just canned the thing. So you know, why in the world? I don't know why we don't see that stuff coming back. Well, it's such uh, a fun party party thing, right? Like you got get the you guys coming over and and you, I mean, you can geek out on one of those things for. For hours right yeah. they are a great party yeah because yeah, you That's just play weird. them and it's done fast right yeah. they go pretty fast i'm still gonna go back to fortnite when it's by myself like, i'm not gonna play these retro games late at night but for like a party game i think it would be a lot of fun oh and by the way you can go to multiple controllers it does support multiple controllers so uh and a raspberry my raspberry pi has four usb ports so i'm pretty sure it would support four controllers i'll let you guys know how it works on the one because i've only got the raspberry pi i think this is a one it's only got two USB ports. I bet if you like, use the older games, Mike, you'd be fine. Those things took nothing. Like, they were huge. Like, in the day, you know, <laughs> they were running fans in the back of those things. And, like, you know, they were pushing them to the edge to make them work. And, and today, you <laughs> like, you know, we I've got more computing power in my Fitbit uh, watch than That's those true. things, you know, had total. So. Yeah. Yeah. So the and and the crazy thing is, there's like you can find some pictures online of people who have taken this thing and laid it on top of a Nintendo. Actually, dang it, I have an actual real Nintendo NES that I found in a basement somewhere, and so I was trying to get it to work years ago. Um, but if you took this and I laid it on top of a regular Nintendo, it is so funny to see the difference in size. And then this thing, it, it lay it on top of a PlayStation, Jim. It's running PlayStation games too. So you have right. to go even bigger. Um, it's it's pretty funny that they do that. And Jim, you don't have to blow into, you don't have to do this. I was going to say, is that the one? <laughs> and then you'd, you'd rub them. There were like eight different actions you would do to try to get those things to work. Which is so funny. They, all the articles are like, that was the worst thing we could have done for those games, right? Like it did not help. Yeah. It was, oh, just, yeah. it was just taking that one back in. That's what all you were supposed to do. You were not supposed to blow on it. Yeah. I, but I, there was like, there was like blow into it, did it. tap oh, yeah. it on your knee <laughs> or like pencil or right. There were all these, there were all these, and you'd be like, why are you doing that? Oh, it just works better. If you just uh, do it, if you just jam a pencil in there, it works better. Right. What? Uh, 
Did you see this? Uh, somebody just cartridge said harmonica. cartridge harmonica. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That is so awesome. True. See, see, everybody's <laughs> loving it because every it, it, oh, it brings you back to your childhood, brain, right? That's what, yeah. Those are the days, Dwayne. They don't have the what was the precursor to virtual reality, which is the tank game, was always my favorite, where you would you would uh, go yeah. up to it, right, and it, it would have that thing over the screen and. You would have the tank controls, yeah. you know, that you do. I was, I love me some tank. That was, uh, that was one of my favorites. Well, that's because you have to have, if you want to play tank, I have to go retro with my Oculus, you know, so I can. I know. Yeah. There you go. Fancy, the fancy the... head, the fancy gear. Hey, you, um, you, you got a little hack. We're going to run out of time and I want to get this hack oh, in here. Oh, okay. So yeah, let's talk so... about your headphones. All right. So. I'm going to talk about this because this is braggy headphones or braggy or whatever you want to freaking call them. Anyway, so um, this these headphones you can get online, and I would tell you that they weren't so good. As a matter of fact, they actually started making a version where you could get custom molds to your ear to address the problem that you couldn't get them to seal real well. And so there may be additional headphones on the market that you can do this, and I'm going to give you a quick tip on this because it costs you – 20 cents maybe to f do this and to save a set of $300 headphones. Um, so I'm going to hold this up and you can see it a little bit. Do you see that orange mm -hmm. in there? And here I'll flip up the flip up the little plastic piece. You see that orange piece? Mm -hmm. That's an actual earplug. And when I say an earplug, like a 30 cent set of earplugs. And what you do is you cut it and then you poke a hole in the center of it and you put it on top of in the actual headphones and it turns it into where it seals in your ears. It takes a set of Braggies and makes them four times louder hmm. um, and actually turns them completely to sound isolating. So if you've ever spent a lot of money on like Sure headphones, I guess would be an example where they have that memory foam thing that fills up in your ear. Hmm. It makes these into a completely, and, and if you don't know about Braggies, Braggies are the ones that actually are completely wireless like this. And I couldn't even use them because in an airport, you the noise would just go around it. Or if you're sitting on an airplane, you would hear the from the airplane. And I don't know if my sound thing here took care okay. of it. But the thing is, is you this solved that problem. I actually use these all the time now. And it actually also fixes the fact that these things have something called like a sound isolation mode, or like where you can turn on and off the ability to hear around you through the microphones in them. And um, it actually fixes that so that it works now. You can hear the things around you because of the fact that now they're isolated out. And it and it is weird when somebody starts cracking a bottle around you because for some reason that thing's like sonic ears for that. <laughs> but but in general, um, yeah, just don't crack a plastic bottle around your broggies because um, you can hear it from miles away. But in general, that's a little tip and trick for you. That another one. So I have another tip and trick that's not an NHL one. Um, and so I would recommend you take a look at that. You can also go on like uh, YouTube. YouTube has several videos that show you kind of how to do it. Uh, to a set of Broggies, but I would tell you any uh, headphones you have like this, if you can figure out a way to get the sound isolation from a set of earplugs, I think you'll find that it will make a, even a bad set of headphones sound good. That's a so good tip. I got a pair of headphones. I'm going to actually try that on because they I have the same problem. They're too quiet. So I'm going to try that out and see if that helps. Yeah. There's a price point on those somewhere between 100 and 350. Kind of depends on what model you get. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And these are the cool thing about these are waterproof. They have uh, sensors in them to check your heart rate. They have four gigs of storage, so you can put music on them and don't even need your phone. Um, you can swim with them, and it even has activity monitoring and keeps up with like running. What's so the if, model on those, Dwayne? These are the Dash. Okay. Um, so I I got these back when they first came out, and then there's a version of them that they will mold something for your ear. I would tell you, don't do it. Just buy the 10 cent earplug or 20 cent earplugs and put them on and you'll get the same quality. So that'll save you probably 100, 200 bucks. Yeah, on Amazon right now, you know, again, some are the Dash version, somewhere between 100 and 150. 
they have a new dash pro with alexa like it like we needed alexa at another place i don't need that in my ears i'll get alexa in your ears yeah so so i can buy amazon crap while from my ears (laughs) while you're out swimming underwater the uh 329 for those so a little little pricey but they come in that little case that you showed yeah which charges it yeah no and i i i do like the idea of some wireless you know, I, where you, if you can get ambient sound through them where you're wearing them all the time and you just don't see them, you know, they're in your ear, but you just, you barely see them. I do like that. that well, look. They, they update these all the freaking time and they just added a new beta feature that works perfectly. And what it is, is it can tell like on your right cheek, you can actually tap your cheek twice and you can choose a fast action for that. Like if, and so I've got that where it's next song. So I can actually just reach up and tap my cheek twice and it'll go group and go to the next song. And then even like when you get a phone call or whatever, it'll say, Do you, would you like to answer the call? And you can shake your head yes or no. And it has like a 4D menu that these things have. So if you if you haven't played with Broggies, I would tell you they're really cool. If you, but you know, again, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say they're the best headphones in the world, but for what they are, like I'll throw this in my pocket whenever we're going to, um, like a sport event, like for my kids or something. And I just want to listen to some music and I can reach up and you just swipe your hand back and in or forward to turn, because it's got like a, like a touchpad type of thing on the side. And I can turn on and off the people talking around me. So, and if you pull one out of your ear, it pauses the music and stops it. So it, stuff like that. I mean, they did a really good job. I mean, I, I would tell you that they're they're pretty good. Uh, my wife has a set of bows that are wireless, and those are those sound probably a little better. But these have a lot more features and everything. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's it's pretty cool. I'd I'd love to get a pair like that. I'm I I you know for traveling I went bows over the year. You know, uh, quite oh, yeah. comfort thirty fives. So those best best headphones ever. Yeah. Just so you know, yeah, for the know. airplane. Yeah. No. Right on. They they're super comfortable great battery life and you've been putting some miles on my friend i mean every time i see you you're flying another five thousand miles somewhere <laughs> to get some things done hey anything um uh as we as we were we're not we get we have a little bit of time here but as you think about some of the stuff you're getting to work on anything you want to talk about or you can talk about <laughs> do you hear every cortana thing in the world going <laughs> off right now what did no. you say? No, it's a reminder. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My, uh, nine, so my yeah. nine o'clock take my medicine reminder went off, too. That's how old I am. Like, hey, yeah. she's, she's <laughs> going to make a like, reminder. <laughs> yeah, Cortana. I, I put that in because yeah. it shows up literally on every screen that I have. Right. And so mm-hmm. at 9 a.m. or 9 p.m., I get this reminder. Hey, because, you know, I haven't been I've never been a guy to take meds in my life ever. And I, I'm on these now. And I was always forgetting. Like, I was just like, how do I figure this out? Well, figured out. I'm always sitting down here at my desk and Cortana reminds me. It's pretty cool. Okay. So, so Jim, take my medicine. <laughs> reminder. That's that what it too? was. It was a 9 p.m. Nicely. Take my medicine reminder. That's mine. That just went That's out. That's mine. I got to go take it. So yeah. Every night at nine. Ooh, All right. right. Yeah, so, Mike. <laughs> how do you feel about that? <laughs> so... I, Hey, Mike, just so you know, though, I, Jim, tell me this. Uh, this is where I actually like Cortana. Like, because I put it on the, I don't know if you noticed, I held up an iPhone. The thing that went off is, is that I actually have a Galaxy S9 that I'm running as my daily driver right now. That's what went off a minute ago. And my Cortana speaker went off. And every computer in my room <laughs> went off yeah. at the same time. And if you're trying to do reminders, that's actually better than Siri. Better than Google now. You know, I actually, that's one of the things I'll give her credit. I've got Cortana integration in through Skype now. And so you, there's like a Cortana bot in there and you can, I get the notification through Skype if that's the way you want to get it. So it's another way. It is pretty pervasive. I mean, it's Cortana is in a lot of things that you can, like you said, it'll, it'll do a lot of stuff for you. It's surprisingly powerful. (laughs) So how funny is it that Cortana interrupted at the time in which you wanted me to start talking about ambient computing 
and yeah. the future I, of this. Was... And and it was a perfect example. It Almost went like everywhere. It. Yeah. I know. And we actually did not plan that, boys and girls. It yeah. it actually happened as a fluke. So I so Jim, you kind of were asking, like, what are some of the things? And uh, most people who know me know that I have been kind of running a role as the worldwide lead architect for Microsoft for connected vehicle um, solutions. So I kind of led from a consulting services perspective. I was leading connected vehicle solutions for Microsoft for the last two or three years. So, um, and everyone's like, oh, so what about sync? And yeah, I had, no, that's not what we do. <laughs> that's like old, old, old stuff. When we were thinking operating systems were important. Um, at this point, operating systems aren't so important. Um, and if you've kind of been listening in, um, Jim, have I ever been on this podcast and said that I that the cell phone is dead? No, not that I know of. Okay, so I'm I've been on a couple of podcasts, and I think I might have actually been on yours a long time ago, and I kind of threw it in there as a Maybe. tagline, Maybe. and and what I said killed the iPhone and killed the cell the smartphone was the thing that we talked about at the beginning was the Raspberry Pi. Hmm. And what it is, is that if you think about this, just think about it for a second, you always had that you had a computer and then you took the computer and you plugged your iPod into your computer to get music. And then that's how you got it. And so you always had this thing where you plug a thing into another thing to be able to make the other thing smarter. And then eventually the other thing com becomes smart enough that it no longer needs the thing you were plugging it into. So if you if you look at it, an iPod became so smart that it replaced the need for you to necessarily plug it into a computer to get music on it. Then it eventually became a phone. And the phone, you didn't have to – you, you used, remember, you used to have to plug a phone into your computer to sync your email and everything. And so now you don't do that or even your contacts. And now you would never even think you would do that, right? And now what are you doing in a car or what are you doing for a lot of things? Everybody's using the phone to plug in. And like, if okay, in your car, how many of like, how many people listen to this plug their phone into their car to listen to music? Yeah. So you think about it, whether you want to say that you're plugging it in, a lot of people argue with me and they go, oh, I don't plug it in. I use Bluetooth. That's just a virtual wire, guys. That's it's like you're you're using the compute power of the phone because you have it to be able to and the connectivity of the phone because the car didn't have it or the in the head unit or something of that nature, you know, or, and so now what you're starting to see and it started in Raspberry Pi and I kind of started following this back then because everybody's like IOT, IOT, right? Internet of Things, if you don't know what that means. Um became kind of a big thing and it started i started looking into it and it was all about like pulling data back and doing predictive maintenance and so if you go back and read a lot of that type of stuff so when you guys show up at build and stuff i think you'll like if anybody's going to build um you'll you'll start hearing about concepts that if you i don't know if people who watch this might also watch paul Therott, um talk about he, he started up, and I, I've kind of been saying this a lot longer than he has, which is ambient computing is the thing that kills the smartphone. Because why, like, I actually think that my kids' kids will look at them and go, you carried a slab of battery around in your pocket? That's so stupid, right? Because why would you do that? It's like you charge. You had to charge that thing every night. That's just crazy. And so I think these type of things, what you're seeing is that the compute power is getting small enough to get built into the device and connectivity is becoming so pervasive. And then you have cloud that became a centralized, highly effective, highly scalable ability to be able to bring compute to a point where you can do some on the device and it can connect to a, a highly connected cloud that can scale out. And so you start getting into this and this is where you start really getting into, 
I can build ambient experiences or an experience that follows me from what I would call multiple canvases. So it can move from a speaker, like we just saw with Cortana. It, it was on a speaker. It was on a cell phone. It was on a computer. And it didn't really matter. And it was a different UI and a different experience that was customized to that location from each of the different places. Um, it's so someone goes, I need need to still be able to talk to uh, my mobile phone because I need to talk through it uh, uh, to be able to talk through the phone. Yeah, but you know what? You a lot of people have a Bluetooth headset. If your phone became nothing but the size of a Bluetooth headset and you could talk to it with a natural language conversation, you don't necessarily need that. And if you were near a screen, it could just display it on any screen that is available at the time. So you start getting into, I don't necessarily need to carry this stuff. And sure, maybe there's still a smartphone, just like there's still a PC and a laptop. But eventually, if you look at the number of devices, and I think, uh, I know Therat's been on this rant about this, is that the thing that, it, if you look at a smartphone, a smartphone is a one-to-one -one relationship to a human being. But when you get into IoT and ambient computing, it's a many to one. So how do you excel and increase more, sell more smartphones than there are people? That's probably not gonna happen, but it is very possible to sell more devices than you have human beings. So an example would be if I had a refrigerator and I like to use refrigerators, I don't know why, I'm just, because most people think refrigerators are dumb, right? But you could put a, you're starting to see refrigerators coming out with screens on them. And that's like for chore charts and for other things and being able to build experiences on a refrigerator, like having an app on your phone or, or you have a notification system, just like that reminder I just got that says, hey, I have a sensor that sees that you're out of milk. You might wanna pick some up because the thing that you're in notices that you're there and it knows that you're close enough to go get milk and your refrigerator is telling you is providing the information that you need milk and so you don't have to do that or you could even say oh it just auto orders milk and the milk's delivered right or things like this are starting to come full circle like the experience needs to go beyond a phone right it needs to go to wherever you are and that is really this whole concept of ambient computing. And what we're really starting to see, and I, I would tell you, if you pay attention to what Microsoft's doing in this space, and I, this is no trade secrets or anything, you start looking at what we're doing around IoT. Everyone thinks like the Windows IoT thing. That really does not that. Go look at IoT Suite. Go look at IoT Hub. The ability to push and pull things from, from devices. And then, and it doesn't matter what OS it is, it, that's that's irrelevant. The actual OS on a, on a device is basically unimportant at this point. Um, the, the, the thing that's important is the ability to get the service at the end point. Mm -hmm. So then you start looking at it and going, well, how do I start building applications that expand and can support an ambient state? And you have to get into conversational UIs and natural language UIs. And so, and if you haven't looked at a combination of something, we we have like a bot framework is a, a new thing. Uh, there'll be some discussion about that at Build, a lot of discussion probably. Um, we have something called Lewis that we've talked about, which is our natural language understanding engine, which means that you, as a programmer, you can program in, uh, I'll give you an example of one that I've recently done. If you say no, you mean, no. If you say okay, then what does that mean? That means okay. But what does it mean when you say no, that's okay? So, it, and so being able to program it, you don't, you program against the intent of what you said, not what you said. And it changes the whole concept. So an example is if I say, um, if you asked me a question like what, what type of restaurant would I want? I'll just use that as an example. And I said, hey, I'd like some pasta. That actually means I want Italian. I need to program that that's Italian is the intent 
But I could have said spaghetti. I could have said lasagna. I could have said any of that. And so what one of the things we're doing with Lewis is being able to let you program a language understanding model to an intent that allows you to be able to do it. And you can do things like synonyms uh, and be able to pull in synonyms. And so when you start looking at that, you can start building. And a lot of this started with the speaker because you needed to be able to do this. But if you've ever ridden in a car, like one of the things you always do is you hate the speech stuff in things. I think the speech stuff is about to change to a point where it's more conversational. You don't have to say it exactly like it, 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 it was supposed to be said. You can actually say stuff like, you know, my clients like pasta. It's, it just goes, oh, I'm looking for what, what kind. If you said pasta, it must mean that that means you want Italian. Right. So things like this are kind of some of the cool things that are starting to come out as we get into ambient um, computing. And then as you start adding all of these different devices and they're all working with you and everything, um, I can start learning a lot more and being able to do machine learning and being proactive and having, you know, maybe when I make recommendations, I can, from all these different places, I start learning what you like and what you don't like, and then being able to kind of make things better. Um, if you haven't played with cognitive services, I know the last time I was on, I, I kind of talked about this, but it, let's go back to our refrigerator model, our refrigerator discussion. Um, now it's gotten to where you don't have to have all these special sensors. Like um, I could actually take a picture of milk, um, uh, of a milk jug and a whole bunch of different milk jugs and say, that's full, that's half full, that's empty. And I could train a model probably within an hour that if you passed me an image from an interior camera of a refrigerator, I could tell you what was in your refrigerator. And I could also tell you whether or not you're out of milk from just a camera. Just like uh, in the car world, to give you an idea, just, uh, you know, some of the ideas I've had like that you know, what could we do is take a picture of the back seat when you get out of a cab uh, and the cat, we knew that you held it. Like think about it in an Uber. I take a picture of the back seat. I identify what does a cell phone look like? What are, uh, what do glasses look like? All of that type of stuff. And you get a message and the driver gets a message. Hey, you just left your sunglasses in the back of the car. Mm -hmm. You know, so stuff like this mm -hmm. are where you start seeing ambient computing getting really cool. Um, so I think what you're going to find is a lot of this stuff is starting to get to a really interesting spot. Um, I noticed somebody was asking about, will cable companies kill this? Well, no, they can't because um, the, a lot of times the service provider and the cost from what I'll call a MNO or a mobile network operator is getting cheap enough, and it's not a ton of data that's going back and forth, that the service itself can fund the cost of a uh, LTE connected device or something like this. And then you start looking at what we can do with edge computing um, and being able to push some of this stuff. Like I can train a model, push it down to the edge um, and be able to run that model on a very low compute and be able to look for an anomaly. And whenever the anomaly goes off, boom, I fire the event. It doesn't really cost me that much to do that. Um, and a lot of these places, they'll even do private MNO connections so that they can connect to a private copy of the, not the public side internet. It's like a private circuit over the MNO provider. So, so again, these are all like some of the things that are really starting to come. And I would tell you, if, if you listen to what's going on with Microsoft and AI, this is our big push, right? We, I actually think this is the next wave. This is the thing that makes having to carry your cell phone really kind of interesting. And if you don't believe it's on its way, look at what Apple did with the Apple Watch in the last release. They put LTE in it so that you don't have to carry your phone. Why can't that thing, it's already got Bluetooth, pair to a, a set of those Apple ear, earphone things, and why the heck to make that phone call did I need to carry the slab of battery around? So, you know, me personally, I would freaking love that. If I could stream music from the watch directly over, or why do I even need to do that? Why can't the watch <laughs> be a trust? Yeah, so it's like, but think about it this way. If the watch is just a trusted device that adds into the car and you say when this watch is present in the car that it's me, then why can't the car just authenticate you to Spotify and just play Spotify? 
Why and why can't the UI be right for the car? Because the thing is, is people don't want a phone UI in their car. They want a UI that's for the car in the car. Yeah. And if you look at like in the state of Georgia, just this past week, I think they passed a new law where you can't hold or touch a cell phone while you're driving. And that's because of the fact that a cell phone is distracting. So when you start building these ambient computing things, you make the UI and the way that it works, it's all about a user experience design and it's all about doing it for what's right for that. So car manufacturers know when the laws allow you and don't allow you to be uh, distracted in certain ways and they can adjust the experience so that you don't have to get a ticket for touching a phone. Uh, I, I mean, one of my goals would be to never have to touch my phone in the car uh, ever. And, you know, I'm having to like take a nice car and put up a sticky mount in the car and hold the phone up and all that type of stuff. But I think that we're starting to get to days where those services can just come to the device itself. And it's going to be about bringing it there in the right format so that it works right. So wasn't that the idea with Apple CarPlay though? Was that they, you take the the <laughs> UI of a car and you just use the phone as, because the cars weren't smart enough yet, you know, they didn't have the connectivity. Okay, let's use the phone's connectivity, but give you a car UI. So let me give you uh, the problem with that, okay? So let's say that you are, I'm going to try to come up with, let's say that you're Toyota, okay? Uh, and Toyota sells a Lexus and they sell a Toyota, okay? Um, why would I want the user experience in a Toyota to be equivalent to a Lexus? How do you separate that, right? And so when you start looking at it in the car manufacturing world, they actually want the experiences and the quality to kind of go up. What you're doing in CarPlay is everything's running on the phone. You're just taking over the whole screen and it's putting a UI that's controlled from Apple. So it's just putting an iPhone in the head unit and all you're doing is like a Citrix thing, right? Like if right. you're familiar with like um, Team Viewer or something like that, that's really all you're doing. And that is not what a car manufacturer wants because that means, and, and the thing is, is that in CarPlay, the, the phone doesn't know a darn thing about the car. It knows nothing. So when a, when a light goes off in the car that says that you've got an error, it, it doesn't even know it happened, right? So From a car manufacturer standpoint that makes a lot of sense right like we want to be able to upcharge people for better experiences but from the user standpoint that's why we still use our phones instead of plugging them because the phone is a consistent experience i have the phone i don't need to worry about what car i bought in order to have the best experience i have the phone so right. from a user standpoint though it's it's not the best idea but it's great for car manufacturers. No, actually, even at a user perspective, it's better if they build an experience that is appropriate for the vehicle because car manufacturers know how to do that. Like they have access to the sensors of the vehicle. The Apple CarPlay stuff is just a smartphone interface for taking okay, over or, a smartphone. Or take, take out Apple Play and just, or sorry, CarPlay and put in just using the phone via Bluetooth. Right, I use the phone, yep. and, and we talked about the whole being illegal part, and, and I get that, but it's the reason we keep going back to the phone is because we have such different experiences across the line, and even if that gets better, they're still going to be okay if I get the you know, if I get a low end car, I'm going to have a low end experience and high end car, high end one, or I can just worry about my phone and always have the same experience and not worry so, about it. So that's kind of the basic experience is being able to make a phone call. What I'm talking about is being able to offer services beyond that. And what you'll find is they're not going to target a service down to uh, a low-end car that you know would not get consumed. Like, uh, why would you put a full-on um, ability to work with a somebody to help you buy, like, stuff and, you know, like a full-on concierge type of service? You're not going to see that pushed into, you know, a Ford Fiesta. Right. Because that's not the market for it. My point is they can bring services that make sense to that market and differentiate their models and their lines to the to the actual person that is intended for the car. When Apple builds what they Apple builds, they basically build something that's just commoditized for the mass. 
and it has no understanding of the vehicle and the extra safety features that you might have, the extra sensors. So if you took this and let's say that you did, you're doing CarPlay in a Tesla, you, you're you actually doing, all you're doing is putting in where you can launch apps in a Tesla in a window, right? And And while that's great and that's good, what if the apps were just in the head unit to begin with and I never had to worry about that crap, right? Like, uh, and so, and not only that, my heads up display shows the information because I actually bought a heads up display. So I wanna see stuff up there. I don't want, or if I started thinking about cars evolving to AR capability, then on the screen, on the windscreens, CarPlay can't know if the car has that feature or doesn't have that feature and can't adapt the UI based upon what's in the vehicle to make it uh, appropriate for the vehicle canvas that it's laying on. So th this is the difference, right? It's, it's a matter of being able to actually build experiences that are better than just mirroring a phone screen, right? Everyone seems to think phone-centric right now, and you kind of have to move away from that and say, what if it was better? Because we think smartphone compared to the vehicle today is better, right? That's is CarPlay better than what was in a older like the cars of today? It probably is when you're talking about listening to music and stuff like that and making phone calls because the speech UI and the car is just awful and all these things are awful. So imagine if it was better than the than the actual phone. What if it was more integrated? So it's kind of like that whole. I'm going to use the Steve Jobs term. You ready for this, Jim? The Microsoft guy using this. If you're rip. serious about software, then you have to make your own hardware. Well, companies that make hardware are starting to go, maybe I should make the software right. that makes it better. And that's where you're starting to see this change. And the compute is getting to such a low cost to get that much compute. And the connectivity is getting to such a low cost that it's actually becoming a situation where you're starting to see just what happened back when you used to think that the best phone in the world was a small phone. Jim, do you remember this? When, when the Matrix came out, everybody wanted the phone that was that little bitty candy bar phone because you didn't want that big hunk of battery in your pocket. We just accepted that I'll carry the big hunk of battery because of the value behind running that much compute. And all you did was just put a laptop in your pocket. I mean, and then quit carrying around a laptop. So yeah, it's lighter than a laptop, but when I make it where you don't have to carry around a slab of battery and you get a better experience than you would get if you carried around a slab of battery, you stop carrying around a slab of battery. Yeah. And that's yeah. that's kind of where we're starting to go. And, uh, you know, that's where yeah. my wor my role seems to kind of be shifting more into how to build these AI experiences for edge devices. And I'm and I'm loving it because it's really cool because it's it's you really have to think about how do I make this better? Like the way that I look at it is. When I'm talking about a car, I'm, I'm looking at it and going, how do I make you not use your phone? How do I make it better than the phone? If, if it's that you would pick up your phone, then it's a problem for me. It, mm -hmm. Then it sucks because it's not good enough. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the world of, in the Star Trek world, right? That's, that's really the world that they don't, they have, they have a badge and it does everything. Right. And when they, you know, they've got some of these, but they're compute devices. They're just handy things that they can push. You know, and who knows where that's going to go. I mean, I, I, I kind of agree with you in some ways. It's tough to think of a world without phones because today that's all there is, right? Well, it used and, to be tough to think of a world without a laptop. Right. Yeah. And, and Jim, think about it. If you go uh, into the I'm Star still... Trek world, you think about Star Trek back in the day, if you really get down to it, the thing that they hit what if that's not really the microphone and that's just the authentication right, device? Right, that's yeah, just a token, yeah. right? Yeah. And then you start thinking, okay, that's how it's identifying who you are and where you are so that the local ambient computer can pick it up. And and then, oh, wait a minute, what did Alexa just make a new keyword? Oh, computer. Right, yeah, 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 no, right on, right on. <laughs> no, right on. Some people though, you know, Dwayne, and we're kind of talking about this in the chat room, 
you know, rural communities or areas where there isn't sufficient compute today. It's a little hard to imagine a day when that is there. But imagine a day when you don't have to have cell towers to necessarily have cell connection, right? When there's different technologies that we haven't even invented yet that are giving you connectivity, whether that's mesh or or wired or it's in the power lines or however that's done, right? Yep. We're just we just don't know how it's going to be done yet, and uh, it, some, we're, they're going to bring some of that connectivity, not necessarily in the way that we think it's connected today, right? Not necessarily with a cell today. When we think of a cell phone, we think of connectivity. What if everything's connected? Like, yeah. what if everything is connected? Well, you start thinking about it. It would be absurd that you would build a a, a processor that was dedicated to do one thing and one thing only. But when you get into the world of the cloud, it's all about performance. And so now you're starting to see things like ASICs and FPGAs and these processors that all they do is this one thing and they do it really, really quick, taking over the world. And and that's pretty crazy if you think about it, because, uh, you know, a general purpose processor is kind of like, yeah, you know. Right, right. Wait, we're out of time. On this segment, we want to talk a little bit. Well, I guess we I said we weren't going to do a post show, but I think we will because we want to talk a little bit. We want to catch up a little bit on on uh, some of that. So if yeah. you're listening live, hang around a little bit. We'll do we've got a little crypto to talk in the post show. Um, Mike, you can stay around for a little little crypto conversation. Oh, for Let, sure. Does that work for you? Okay. Yeah. Pretty good. And uh, Dwayne, cool. can you hang Mike, on, Dwayne, for some crypto conversation? Yeah. And Mike's going to love this because I right, don't give it away. This round. Don't give it away. Uh, come out. We'll we'll also make the post show available for free on Patreon this week. So head out to theaverageguy.tv slash Patreon. There's an audio and video available for you out there if you want to go out and watch it and uh, you want to catch what we say out in the uh, out in the post show available for you. Don't forget, you can also help if if you want to help support us while you're out there. You can. It's totally up to you. Uh, you can drop a dollar pledge in there. One dollar a month. Super easy to get in there and to make that work. Head out to theaverageguy.tv slash Patreon. I'll remind you, you can contact me, Jim, at theaverageguy.tv. Twitter's a great great way to do it, at Jay Collison. Get you there as well. If you want to join us in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash theaverageguy. And there's always some deals, Kevin or Michael or uh, someone's always dropping a deal out there, at least one or two a week. And, uh, Mike, was there anything this week you remember? I thought we had a, we had a pretty good deal. I'm not deal on Facebook there. anymore. Oh, that's right. So I don't see it. Wow, him. dude, I, you're completely. It's completely gone. Completely gone. Well, gone, I, mean, gone? I, I don't have. I didn't delete the account, but uh, the app is off, and I don't. I log in maybe once, uh, uh, once every two weeks. I guess we'll let that go. Kyle Wilcox was questioning my statement from last week when I said email was broken, so that was pretty cool, and uh, so we had a conversation around that. Uh, Michael Ray put out a this Roomba like device. That's actually, it weeds your garden for you. So they now have a robot vacuum, a robot mower, and now a robot gardener. And Don't it's got, it. yeah, it's got a little, um, it has a little weed whacker on the bottom and it goes over and you protect your plants with little things around them so that it doesn't whack those. But then it senses a weed, spins the weed whacker. It's got a little charger on top and uh, you can check that out. You know, I'm, you know I love those things. You think that thing might have some IoT or connectivity? Just or... a little. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Just a little. So join us on our Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash group slash the average guy. Don't forget that the uh, average guy TV, uh, both web and media hosting powered by Maple Grove Partners, get secure, reliable, high speed hosting from people that you know and trust. And of course, Christian contributes to power that for us. And we appreciate Maple Grove Partners for their support. Get more information, maplegrovepartners.com. And don't forget, download the app if you haven't done that. Easiest way to listen on the road, live, whatever. It's a great way to do it. HomeGadgetGeeks.com. Just download it. Have it as a backup on this phone while you have, still have it. I mean, there'll come a day when you don't need that phone anymore, according to Dwayne. But yes. uh, for now, you still need that app on your phone. So go download it. Have it available. It's a great backup for whatever reason you do listen to the show and you don't want to look it up or find it anywhere. You can do that as well. We are live every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out here at the Average Guy TV Live. We'll stay around for a little bit of post show. Got an update on some burst and uh, some other crypto. By the way, great day in the market today. Uh, Bitcoin, 9,600 right now. Whoa, whoa. Like, yeah, boom. 
So you want to stay around for the post show with that. We'll say goodbye, everybody.